You're absolutely right, I am brewing outside with an ugly Christmas sweater on for all to see. Anyway, today we're making a Red X and CTZ Smash IPA. So hey, if it's your first time here, just want to say welcome. Uh, this channel is all about making cream to glass videos, which basically means that I take a beer uh, from the recipe stage all the way through the brew, the fermentation, and then the final tasting all in the same video so that you get to see every single piece of the process and how it impacted the final beer without having to search around for where the tasting video actually ended up. Uh, anyway, if you like that type of thing, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, and also while you're down there, please hit the like button for this video. It does help out quite a bit and makes me very happy. So they have a saying in New England that uh, if you don't like the weather, just uh, wait 15 minutes. And five days ago, I was brewing right here on this porch in the middle of a blizzard. So, snow. And here we are today, it's like almost 50 degrees outside and it's sweater weather, so it's the week of Christmas and I'm just going full send, so we're going to be brewing outside in this uh, ugly Christmas sweater which has its own integrated beer koozie, so I'm feeling pretty good about today. Today we're making a Red X Smash IPA, which basically means single malt and single hop. Smash beers are real easy to make, I've made them several times before on the channel, um, and it's just a simple way to showcase either a single hop or a single malt. And you can make an IPA out of a smash beer, or a pale ale, you have a, technically a pilsner as a smash beer too, if you want to like run some really, really nice pilsner malt in that. Um, so a lot of possibilities, but today we're going to be going down the more common just IPA route. Um, I am going for a Northwest style red colored IPA. And for the malt, we're going to be using Best Malt's Red X Malt, which is a malt that I didn't really know about until a couple months ago. Uh, I was actually introduced to it by the Genus Brewing Channel of all places. Uh, so they use it pretty frequently and uh, have a lot of good things to say about it. Supposedly, it's very similar to Munich malt, has a lot of different complexities and character to it, despite being a single malt. You can use it up to 100% of your grist, and uh, it comes out with a pretty strikingly red color. So I'm excited to check that out. And then for our hop, we'll be using CTZ. CTZ stands for Columbus Tomahawk Zeus. Uh, all three of those names refer to the exact same hop. Uh, so eventually people just kind of decided to loop them all into that CTZ acronym. And uh, that's what it's known as today. It's actually an old school hop. It's been around for a long time. Uh, so we're gonna take an old school hop and a new school malt and put them together and uh, see what happens. CTZ should be pretty um, aggressively west coast. It's gonna be bitter, it's a high alpha hop. It's gonna be uh, probably somewhat resinous and grapefruity, very classic IPA type of hop. So at the end of the day, we're looking for a very Northwest inspired IPA here. Um, so, man, everyone's looking at me in my sweater. That means it's going to be very different, obviously, from the East Coast style or the hazy IPAs that we all know and love. Northwest IPAs and West Coast IPAs kind of, I, I kind of grouped them together a little bit. Uh, but they're kind of the original IPA, really. It's a clear beer. It's just going to be a little bit darker than pale to red color, which is what we're going for today. And um, has a lot more aggressive hop punchiness, bitterness. Um, and you're gonna get a lot more like piney, resinous, and grapefruity type flavors out of it because the hops are used primarily in the boil as opposed to being post-boil or whirlpool where you get those juicy flavors. Also, the yeast is gonna be a lot different as well. Typically, you're gonna use a, a standard American ale yeast for it um, instead of a, uh, an English yeast or a low flocculation yeast that does a biotransformation thing where it turns the uh, hop oils into juicy flavors. These IPAs should be dry, clean, and super drinkable. These beers should also be pretty strong up there about six and a half to eight percent ABV and uh, pretty aggressively hopped somewhere between 50 to 80 IBUs. So without further ado, let's just roll into the recipe now. So as I mentioned, our malt, the only malt we're using is Best Malt's Red X. Uh, so we're gonna use 13 pounds of that in the grain bill. And then for hops, I'm gonna be using only CTZ and my CTZ is 14.8% alpha acid. So I will be adding uh, half an ounce at 60 minutes, one ounce at 15 minutes, one ounce at 10 minutes, and an ounce and a half at zero minutes or knockout. That should get us somewhere around 70 to 72 IBUs of bitterness. We're looking for a bitterness to gravity point ratio of a little over one. Following that, we're gonna dry hop post-fermentation. This is another difference uh, between West Coast and East Coast IPAs. We're gonna dry hop after fermentation, or at least the primary phase is completed and the Krausen has fallen back into the beer for about five days with two ounces of CTZ. For our yeast, we'll be using Imperial Dry Hop, which is a very citrus forward yeast that is flexible and that you can use it for both New England and West Coast style IPAs. Uh, so it should be pretty fun to see what that does here. I've made a starter of that because the packet of yeast that I had is kind of old. Uh, so I just wanted to be sure that I had enough yeast ready to go. 
So for the water profile, I'm gonna be using a base of eight gallons of distilled water so that everyone can copy this and use it for their own recipes, for their own IPAs. This is a very bitter biased water profile with about a three to one sulfate to chloride ratio, which is going to make a very bitter, dry tasting beer in the way that West Coast IPAs really should be. So that water profile is 97 parts per million of calcium, 13 parts per million of magnesium, 27 parts per million of sodium, 198 parts per million of sulfate, 64 parts per million of chloride, and 71 parts per million of bicarbonate. So now something to notice there, that little bit of bicarbonate in there is just to adjust for the color. Since this is not a pale beer, you're gonna want a little bit of bicarbonate in there to keep the mash pH in check and make sure that your residual alkalinity is where it's supposed to be. So like I said, we're gonna be using eight gallons of distilled water. So in order to reach the water profile I just mentioned, we're gonna add eight grams of gypsum, four grams of epsom, four grams of calcium chloride, and three grams of sodium bicarbonate or baking soda. So if you're gonna use this water profile for a regular paler IPA, I would suggest not adding any baking soda whatsoever. That is only in there because this is not as pale of a beer um, as most IPAs are. So we're just gonna make sure we try to keep that residual alkalinity in check. Um, if that doesn't necessarily make that much sense to you, don't fear. Um, just add a little bit of baking soda to your darker beers and uh, that's really what that's getting at. For our mash, we're gonna be mashing uh, for about 90 minutes at 150. We're gonna try and attenuate this a little bit, so I'm using a sort of medium-low mash temperature here. Um, that's just gonna keep everything uh, nice and dry uh, and try to also lower our final gravity a bit, which is also gonna make the beer uh, a little bit hoppier and have a little bit more bite um, and also be a little bit more drinkable at the same time. All right, we're gonna wait for the strike water to get up to temperature, but once it does, we'll go ahead and dough in, so I'll catch you there. Once my strike water reached the mash in temperature, I mashed in with a grain bill, being sure to stir well to ensure that there were no clumps in the mash. Next, I restarted recirculation and let the mash sit for about 90 minutes at 150 degrees to ensure a complete conversion. After five minutes, I cooled down a sample of wort for a pH measurement and was very pleased to see a pH of exactly 5.2. Once 90 minutes had elapsed, I observed a copper colored wort and set the temperature on the controller to 168 degrees for the mash out. This denatures all enzymes in the mash and helps the wort drain through the grain bed a bit easier. After reaching the mash out temperature, I let it stay there for about 15 minutes and then pulled out the grain basket and let it drain for another 15 minutes. However, as soon as I did that, I fired up the controller to 100% power to get a jump start on the boil. I pulled a sample of wort for the pre-boil gravity reading and recorded a measurement of 13.5 bricks or 1053, which was about three points lower than Beersmith had estimated. Once I reached the boil, I added my 60 minute bittering charge of half an ounce of CTZ. Forty-five minutes later, I came back to add the 15 minute addition, one more ounce of CTZ. Five minutes later, I added yet another ounce of CTZ for the 10 minute hop addition, in addition to two teaspoons of yeast nutrient and a Whirlflock tablet. But sadly, my camera decided to die while I was filming this, so unfortunately I don't have the footage to show you. At this time though, I also started to recirculate boiling wort through my chiller in order to sanitize it. This is the easiest way to ensure sanitation of your chilling equipment. After 10 more minutes had elapsed, I killed the boil and added my zero minute knockout addition, another ounce and a half of CTZ. Then I took the entire setup inside to where I could hook the chiller up to the kitchen sink and begin chilling. I took a sample and recorded an original gravity of 14.5 bricks, which is about 1058, and that is significantly lower than planned. I was worried at the time that this would make my beer too unbalanced, with not enough alcohol to counter the amount of hops that I threw in. But I never should have been concerned. The beer actually turned out great. Once I reached a wort temperature of about 65 degrees, I transferred the wort, splashing to aerate, and pitched my yeast. All right, so now let's talk about fermentation. Uh, this one's not gonna be super complicated to ferment, actually, uh, which is nice. IPAs are typically done with standard American ale yeasts, and um, there's a couple different ways you could go about doing it. The first way is to simply ferment at about 65 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit for about two weeks, um, and that should give you a pretty solid beer. The second way is to ferment under pressure slightly. Uh, the theory behind this is that it's gonna trap some of those volatile hop compounds and some of those delicate 
aromatic compounds can get off-gassed by CO2 coming out of the yeast in the fermenter. So the idea behind pressure fermenting an ale is that you give a little bit of pressure, not too much pressure because you still want some esters to come through. Um, but you just give a little bit of pressure and that should help keep the uh, hop aromatics in there. I'm not really gonna do that because I'm using Imperial's dry hop yeast. Dry hop is really a, a yeast that is kind of specifically chosen for its ester profile that will complement these beers. I think in my situation, I'd rather lose a little bit of hop aromatics in standard fermentation, but keep the ester profile of a solid ale yeast versus try to trap all the hop aromatics and then not have any yeast input. Fermenting an ale under pressure doesn't always make sense since you will mute a lot of those esters. However, with a New England IPA or a hazy IPA, that's definitely a situation where it would probably be beneficial to do under pressure. And so next time I brew one of those, I will probably be doing that under pressure. However, I still will be using my Firmzilla to ferment this. And the reason for that is because of that collection jar that's on the bottom. So basically what I'll do is I'll put my dry hops in there right now, I'll purge it with CO2, and then pressurize it um, so that when it actually becomes time to dry hop, which will be several days into fermentation, all I have to do is open that valve and then the dry hops will get sucked into the rest of the beer and we'll continue on. Um, it's a method that's worked fine in the past and it's kind of what that's designed for. If you don't have something like that, it's totally fine. You can choose to open your fermenter and chuck your dry hops in and close it real quick. Now it's reasonable to be worried about oxidation uh, in a hop forward beer like this. Um, oxygen can get in there and really mute hop flavors very quickly and cause the beer to have a short shelf life. So I really would suggest uh, dry hopping techniques that don't involve actually opening your fermenter. So basically I would put my hops and a sanitizable stainless steel object, uh, magnetic, in a dry hopping bag and I'd, I'd basically stick that on the very top uh, of the side of my fermenter. Um, if you have a bucket, you can stick it under the lid. And then I take a stack of neodymium magnets and I put them on the other side of wherever I wanted that stuff to hang. So basically at that point, once it's time to dry hop, you just pull the stack of magnets off and then the whole thing drops into the beer when it's time to dry hop and then you're good to go. Uh, plus it's all in a bag so you can fish it back out later on when you're done with the dry hopping. I'm pleased to say the brew day today went very well. Uh, it's definitely a lot warmer outside than my last one where it was 15 degrees. So uh, the timeline for getting things going from temperature to temperature uh, was a lot faster and um, I think it's a little bit easier to manage this stuff. The word is a nice dark copper tone right now uh, and that should just uh, turn to a nice shade of red once it clarifies and you get a little bit more volume behind it than just that little sight glass that I have. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited for, to see how this one turns out. Um, anyway, in a nutshell, fermentation going to be about 65 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in a standard non-pressurized fermentation, or you can add a little bit of pressure to a pressure-capable fermenter and ferment at you know a higher temperature. Timeline in both cases is probably going to be about 10 days to 14 days, um, and then also you're going to have a dry hopping addition in there with two ounces of CTZ, which you're going to drop in after about seven days. Uh, whenever your primary Krausen has fallen back into the beer, that's when you'll know it's time to start your post-primary fermentation dry hop. All right, so this is our final gravity sample, um, and it's about 1012, so that's actually a little bit lower than we had anticipated, but that's still actually great. Uh, makes this beer a little less sweet, and uh, that's kind of the way an IPA should be. Uh, check out how much dry hopping material fell out of the, uh, the sample here. <laughs> uh, so it's gonna need some time to clarify in the keg. All right, so the time has finally come to taste this beer. Uh, fermentation went off pretty well. Uh, we ended up having a pretty fast fermentation. It was about eight or nine days total. Um, and part of that is due to the fact that I pitched a lot of yeast. I obviously did a large starter, but I built that starter off of a 200 billion cell count uh, Imperial yeast packet, which already has a lot of yeast in it anyway. Um, and I wasn't sure about the viability on that one, so I, I made the decision to use the starter anyway, but the result was a very fast, clean fermentation. Uh, I believe primary fermentation was done after like two or three days. Once I saw that Krausen had fallen and decided to dry hop at that point in time, using the little collection jar attachment on the uh, Firmzilla that I have, and then I made the impulsive decision to basically just close off the fermenter and leave it at about 15 PSI so that I could get a jump start on the uh, carbonation of the beer. So there was continual fermentation going on that was providing pressure and carbonating the actual beer, um, and it was effective, it worked. <clears throat> However, and you'll find this entertaining, come kegging day, uh, I realized that I had forgotten to install the floating dip tube, which you use to transfer the beer out of the fermenter without opening it up. It connects to basically a little keg post attachment on top of the fermenter, which allows you to draw that pressurized beer out of the fermenter. Well, I forgot to install that, and the only way to get that in there and actually transfer my beer over was to 
depressurize the fermenter, and install the, uh, the floating dip tube. Now, when I did this, I forgot that it was under pressure. So I opened up the fermenter, popped it open, and immediately vented all the pressure. And I basically had about three seconds to realize that all the carbonation that was in the beer was rapidly coming out of solution and basically like boiling the beer upwards uh, very fast. And if I had not literally slapped the lid on the fermenter and put all of my body weight on it, it probably would have exploded all over my kitchen. So. Uh, that was a, quite the episode. I let the pressure out gradually and with a little bit of mess, uh, but overall we did save the beer. Uh, however, what we did not save was the lovely luscious hop aroma that was then just distributed all over my house. Um, so sadly, I have to report that the hop aroma on this beer definitely could have been better. Um, and it is entirely my fault that it is not. So if you do have a, a pressure capable fermenter, uh, do cap it off and leave it at a higher pressure. Um, once you dry hop, it will preserve a whole ton of aroma. Just remember that if you do that, be prepared to close transfer it into your keg and not have any excuse to open that thing up because it will foam uh, all over the place. That being said, the beer turned out pretty well and I am very excited to share it with you guys. So we're gonna go ahead and dive into it. Okay, so it's called the X Factor, and it comes in at 6.1% ABV and 71 IBUs. All right, for appearance of the beer, it is pouring a hazy red color. Um, it really does seem to be on the darker side of red, closer towards a copper or brown color even because of that haze. It has a uh, cream colored head that is quite robust and sticks around for a long period of time. All right, so now we're gonna go in for aroma, which like I said, probably would have been a lot more substantial if I hadn't let all that pressure out of the fermenter. Still, nonetheless, I get a pretty strong aroma out of this one. It's got a good mix of maltiness, breadiness, and uh, overall hop character, which is along the lines of a, a pineapple and um, a slight bit of resinousness, res resinousness, resiny notes. There's a nice malty sweet note to this that you uh, wouldn't expect to come from an IPA because you still get a lot of that hop character in the aroma, but also you get a significant amount of maltiness. And then we'll go for mouthfeel. Mouthfeel is right where it should be, medium light. The water profile for this beer set it up so that there would be a dry finish, and there absolutely is. And also because this is kind of a maltier IPA than I think a lot of people are used to, um, it's good to see that it still finishes dry and doesn't end up becoming a, a kind of sweet, thick mess that gets blended with hops. Sometimes you get that with double IPAs and it's not very pleasant. Uh, so I'm happy to tell you that this is quite drinkable. And now, flavor. Being that this is a single malt and single hop beer, uh, each component of this beer is relatively important to talk about in detail uh, by itself. So we're going to start with the malt and then we'll move to the hops. Uh, so for the malt, obviously Red X, um, it is a very, very Munich-like malt. It's almost got that character of a dark Munich. It's got this really nice rich breadiness to it um, with also kind of a solid, just uh, the, the kind of solid graininess you get out of a two row. Uh, the malt comes through very cleanly. It's not too sweet. Um, but it is very complex and interesting. This is why sometimes people are suggested to use Red X in place of things like medium caramel malts to add color to your beer. But overall, it's a very complex and interesting malt. It's got a little bit of like a, a bread crust character to it and some slight uh, caramel-like, not quite full-on caramel, but caramel-like notes to it. So it has a faux sweetness. As this is an IPA, you get a lot more hop character up front and you get the, the malt kind of in the back at the end of it. So uh, it, it is a really nice kind of combination of two very different flavors that work very well together. Uh, so then we'll go on towards hops now. So it's CTZ, right? CTZ is pretty much known for its uh, bittering qualities, uh, but it's not necessarily always used in the late boil or even as a dry hop. Um, and it is really performing very well in both of those cases right now. Um, the, the hop character coming out of this is actually quite gentle and restrained. There is a balanced bitterness here, but it's not aggressive. It doesn't have a really rough cohumulin bite because CTZ doesn't really even have that much cohumulin in it. Um, it is actually a very smooth and gentle bitterness up front. I only used half an ounce in the bittering charge, and yeah, I probably could have upped that a little bit, maybe more like three quarters of an ounce if you want a little bit more aggressiveness in the bittering charge. 
uh, it's a very gentle IPA. Uh, it's not as aggressive as your typical West Coast example would be. It's largely got a very tropical fruit type character coming through. A lot of like a pineapple, really, and a grapefruit is coming through very strongly, as well as a amount of resinous character. Uh, there's this like an herbal note as well. There's also a very, very slight woody character to it as well. Not as much so as, as you would get out of like a Northern Brewer, but um, just a little hint of it. But um, the beer itself, well, considered hoppy, um, is not necessarily actually that hoppy. The calculated 71 I've used might be a little bit of an unfair portrayal of the uh, bitterness of it. It's actually quite mild. And funny thing is, this haze is making me think about something here. Um, because I used Imperial Dry Hop, it has a little bit of the Conan strain in it, which means that it's entirely possible that I accidentally biotransformed my dry hopping edition. The intent was not to have that happen. The intent was just to drop clean and bright so that you could see how red the malt actually would end up making the beer. But because we have this haze in here, it's more of a brown color. Um, and the haze is not dropping out no matter what I'm trying to do to it. Um, I tried hitting it with gelatin, I tried cold crashing it, and that haze is solidly in there. And it's not just a chill haze, it's actually quite significant haze. Which makes me think that I might have biotransformed. And if you don't know what that means, it means you did an early dry hopping addition and your yeast interacted chemically with your hops and created particles that essentially um, are suspended in the beer, no matter what you do with them. And they will stay that way for a very, very long time, but they also will create some very phenomenal juicy flavors, which is something that I'm getting out of this. So a lot of the flavor that I am getting out of this is indeed similar to that which you would get out of a New England IPA, just with obviously a lot more maltiness and a lot less creaminess and some bitterness on top of it. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it as a New England IPA hop. I think there's a little too much resinousness to it. Whatever the proper descriptor for that character is, I don't know what it is. You get a little bit of that kind of pine character, which I think would not necessarily be welcome in a New England IPA. It smells super, super tropical. It's got this like dank, tropical, and uh, and just overall fruity character. Now, while I would still hesitate to use it in a New England IPA, it wouldn't make a bad IPA in any other category. Um, which is why this works so well as a Northwest IPA, because it's got that nice maltiness and just complex character that you would get out of a West Coast IPA uh, without all the harsh bitterness that you would get out of a West Coast IPA. Um, without, you know, actually being a, a juice bomb like you get in a New England IPA. Um, it's, it's actually quite a solid beer. For having only like three primary ingredients, malt, hops, and yeast, um, this is a great beer. <laughs> um, I've had, <laughs> it's been hard for me to work on the other beers in my kegerator because this is actually kind of becoming my favorite one right now. This is far, far easier to drink and more tasty than the English IPA I made uh, a couple weeks ago, and as was published in my last video. And um, it's a lot more sessionable than my Scotch Ale, the Wee Heavy I still have on tap. So yeah, it's uh, it's really coming through as a, as a winner. Um, just obviously I am a little crushed that the uh, hop aroma just dis dispelled out of my fermenter when I had that accident, but uh, what can you do? Can't really go put it back in. Uh, <laughs> but it's still quite good regardless. So as far as improvements to this beer go, I really can't think of anything other than tailoring the hop schedule to what you like. Um, I think it would work in either direction if you like more bitter or less bitter beer. Um, and that is entirely dependent upon the bittering charge. So have at it, just customize to your heart's delight. But I can tell you that CTZ and Red X work together like beautifully, so it works. Um, the dry hop yeast definitely pushed a lot of those uh, fruit forward esters out there. Uh, it definitely works really well in this style as well. Uh, I wouldn't hesitate to use that again in any IPA, uh, West or East Coast. And once again, I believe Red X may end up uh, in my frequently used malts list now. Um, this is actually the first time I've ever used it, and I am very pleasantly surprised. It's basically the love child of a Munich malt and a medium caramel malt without the bad parts of caramel malt, so uh, really happy with that. So it will probably be used as a color adjustment addition in my future beers, um, as well as just an additional layer of malt complexity that could probably replace like a Crystal 40. And one more note, I absolutely love smash beers. They're fantastic ways to test your brewing skills because there's nothing to hide behind. You can't layer tons and tons of malts on there to hide any sort of brewing 
uh, problems that you may have in your process. And they also highlight the best parts about each individual malt you choose and each individual hop you choose. It is an absolutely foolproof method for figuring out uh, how a particular ingredient is going to affect any of your upcoming brews with it. Uh, so definitely a big proponent of doing this stuff. It's a lot of fun and it's super cheap and super easy and super rewarding. Although I wouldn't do this with like a Hallertown. Hold on, I'm gonna pour myself another one of these. So hopefully everybody had a good holiday and uh, a good new year as well and enjoyed watching me brew in my dumb Christmas sweater. Uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, yeah, here's to a better 2021 than 2020. Uh, the first couple days have looked good and then, ugh, um, but hopefully the rest of it's okay. But if you do end up being quarantined or locked down for whatever reason, uh, you do know where to go to find a good solid smash beer recipe. So I do appreciate everybody's views on this. If you want to brew the beer, the recipe is in the description box down below for the claw hammer system and it should work just fine for a grandfather robo brew or brewer's edge type system with a little bit of adjustment if you uh, feel that you need that. Um, otherwise, it should be good to go. I really do hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, you learned something, hit that like button, it makes a big difference for me. And also hit that subscribe button, because I will kick out a new Grain of Glass video roughly every two to three weeks. And uh, if you don't want to wait around that long, it's totally fine and understandable, but I have an Instagram, it's at The Apartment Brewer on Instagram, so feel free to follow me there, as well as a Patreon, which I'm going to link up here in the corner. And uh, I am super stoked about that because we have a lot of additional video content there, and we just hit 10 Patreon supporters, which is huge because I am now going to be able to upgrade some of my production quality, and that is all thanks to you guys. I really do appreciate your support, and I'm very grateful for it. Comment down below with your favorite smash beer or your best smash beer. I just want to talk about smash beers because I kind of want to do a little bit more of this type of thing this year, so hopefully we can make that happen, and I would be very grateful to get some ideas from you guys. Um, if you're interested in purchasing the Claw Hammer system, we got a link down below, so that's a great way to support both Claw Hammer Supply as well as my channel. Uh, I also have links to Amazon where you can purchase a bunch of other brewing equipment that I own as well, so check out those lists if you're interested. And that's going to be it for this one, so I'll catch you guys in the next one, so until then, cheers! Thank you.